You heard about ISIS? I have met them in person. They wanted to kill me because I had skinny jeans. <gasps> I don't have a, a university degree. Mm -hmm. Earned million of dollars. So what are you doing? You should be doing something criminal. I came to Norway as a refugee after the war in Syria. So we were like really broke. You can't be special. We don't like you if you are special. And the only thing we accept in our culture, get a job and be normal as everyone else. So they're socialist. They're socialist countries. Extreme. But in Norway, I believe that's the most extreme. My name is Adib, I am from Syria. I came to Norway as a refugee after the war in Syria. When, when that happened, so I just understood I cannot, I will get to Yeah, I miss you, Adib and wise. If I did, I would know. Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. Today we have a very special guest. We have Adib Waiz here. He is a serial entrepreneur and he's got thousands of followers on YouTube and TikTok. He's from Norway, and funnily enough, he's my neighbor. So I'm really <laughs> excited to have him on. Hi, Adib, how are hey, you? Hey, I'm good, how are you? Yeah, happy Thank you. you, very exciting today. I know, <laughs> it is really excited to have you on because I've seen you obviously in the gym, <laughs> <laughs> all around the building, um, and I've seen some of your stuff. And, you know, I think that a lot of my viewers would really like to know, how did it all start? Yeah, it, uh, it's a very, very long story, actually. Uh, so you told them that I am from Norway, but I actually just lived in Norway for 10 years. Oh, so okay. the real story, that I am from Syria. So I, bec I came to Norway as a refugee after the war in Syria. Oh, wow. So it was like when the war started, all this bombing and all this stuff, uh, I traveled as a refugee to Norway and yeah, it was crazy in Syria. So like one of the craziest thing I ever experienced there, you heard about ISIS? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we all heard about <laughs> ISIS. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you're Muslim, I you know about <laughs> ISIS. <laughs> I have met them in person. So they haven't, they had a knife and they, they wanted to kill me because I had skinny jeans. <gasps> <laughs> like for real. So that's happened when I was How in Syria. How old was you? 16 years old. So I was 16 years old, uh, but I experienced the war for two years in a row in Syria. And then when, when that happened, so I just understood I, gonna, I would get killed if I don't travel. But the main problem, it was the money. Because in Syria, like when the war started, my family lost their jobs. So we was like really broke. The really? only thing we had, it was the apartment we owned. And my father had... Uh, has his car and the work he had and everything. And we needed to sell absolutely everything to get the money to for me to be able to, to, to travel. So they, th they didn't leave Syria? And uh, yeah, later, but not, okay. not, not, not in that point. So, so the cost was 7,000 euro and that was everything we owned. So we sold the apartment, we sold the cars, we sold everything. And we gathered the money and we need to lend uh, to loan some money also. Um, so we got the 7,000 euro and my journey started. So it was like running through the jungle from Syria to Turkey, taking a small boat over the sea. So all that crazy shit happened and I arrived to Norway. So that was in 2013. What were you feeling when you were like, okay, so I've always wondered this, right? These refugees, they leave a country, their home, they leave everything behind. They go to a different country, completely different to what they're used to. What were you feeling like during that journey? So because you've left your mom, yeah, left so your dad. Right? Yeah, the, the journey was exciting, to be honest, because it was like something I was looking uh, for. Because I knew if I still was in Syria, I, gonna, I will get killed. That's for sure. And my family will get killed. So that was the last hope. But if I didn't arrive, the family was done because we sold everything. So they didn't, they didn't have any money for rent. So it was only three months. Uh, that's the buffer. Mm -hmm. So if I didn't arrive to Norway and work my ass off to pay that, everyone in the family would be killed. So, but the journey was exciting because I was thinking like, what I left behind me is so bad. I will never come back there. So it was very, very exciting to arrive. But after I arrived, that was depressing. Because it didn't do anything in Norway, right? Yeah. It was snowing, cold. You don't know if you if they will like if you are welcome there. You don't know anything. What was the culture shock like for you when you arrived to Norway? Uh, 
Yeah, just like like before before the culture, it was like the weather. It was <laughs> snowing. It was like minus thirty. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, it was okay. completely new. And I was in in uh, in a place with a lot of refugees, and I was the only one from Syria. Everyone else was from Somalia, Afghanistan. So I was number one uh, without his family arrived to Norway uh, in this time. So yeah, it was crazy experience. So I was very afraid, was very depressed, like what's gonna happen now? So I waited like for three months and finally I got my residency. Oh, and wow. they sent me to a home and my life started. So I was very exciting to learn a language, just like, yeah, went crazy in school, got some jobs and yeah, went totally crazy just to get things done. Well, so you were 16 when you arrived to Syria, um, to Norway, I mean, so you... Yeah, 16, okay, yeah. 16. And then you got a job straight away in Norway. Yeah, so actually not, but I asked them, I asked them like, listen, I don't want to get help from the government. So I want that, but I want also to work. So don't, don't just give me the help. So they just tried to find me some work, but mm. it was very cheap work. Mm -hmm. So I maybe earned... I don't know, five hundred five hundred dollars a month. I work every day. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh wow. That was in Norway, yeah. In, in, in a place, very small place with five thousand people, it's called Tinset. And it was extremely cold. Yeah. Five thousand people living in a small village. <laughs> how how were the how was the people uh like when you entered Norway? Because um, you know, from the UK I've seen like there's a lot of hate for refugees entering the system and there's different sorts of people and some people are accepting. Yeah. What was it like for you? So I didn't feel that, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, the, the Norwegian people are very, very friendly, especially if they see that you are working hard, you're doing your part of the job and you just mm. like don't lay home and get uh, help from the government. So they was very friendly, to be honest. Uh, but at the same time, you always feel that you are not from the country, right? You don't so feel, yeah. You don't feel yeah. that. So n now I feel that. I feel Norway is my home, to be honest. Oh, wow, uh, yeah, okay. I, uh, yeah, I got that after after working in the country, getting some friends, speaking the language very well, have been on the TV for many, many times. Mm -hmm. uh, so I feel it's my home. But at the beginning, it was very hard to get friends because we don't understand. Like, okay, I, I can explain something. So in Syria, right, I had never touched a girl because in Syria, that's that's... <laughs> That's 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 not normal, right? Yeah, yeah. Of course, when I arrived like to Norway, I went to school. For me, that was porn in life, it, like in in real life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I seeing guy kissing a girl in the school, and I was oh my god. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> that's never seen before. Yeah. I seen like the guys and the girls had like boyfriend, girlfriends. Yeah. That was totally different for me. Mm -hmm. And I was calling my friend like. Man, what we watched in f in videos, I can see it in real life here. Oh my <laughs> god, that's so funny. That's yeah. so funny because you don't really actually understand how like some of these other countries they're not exposed to what we're exposed to, yeah. and th when they come here, they're just like, "What? That's crazy!" Like once my mum saw me watch a TV program, and she was like, "What is this stuff you're watching?" And it's just girls in bikinis, and she's <laughs> like, "This is porn." And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and it's like it's not this is just what we see like day day by day exactly so your whole history in norway so you're based in dubai now and your home is in norway yeah yeah so i'm trying i'm trying actually to feel home in dubai i i can't feel it yet because i just been here for six months but after working very hard in norway starting the career and changing my mindset i understood that's becoming successful in norway it's near impossible why because is that? Uh, the system the system is against you in in like absolutely everything. So in Norway we have a thing called Yantalov, and that's mean you can't be special. We don't like you if you are special. We don't like you if you have a very much ambitions. The only thing we like and the only thing we accept in our culture is that you get a job, finish the school, get a job, and be normal as everyone else. If you try to become successful, if you try to earn some money, we will do everything to stop you. And many of the ri like the richest people in Norway say exactly the same thing. They've also got like a small mindset. They don't want to see people grow and become like entrepreneurs and yeah. and start businesses. Because that's greedy. They think that's very greedy. It's 
totally bad because if you become successful, you are actually taking from the poor. So they're socialist. They're socialist countries. Extremely. Oh wow! The next, I didn't next know level. that. Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and Finland—they have this kind of culture. That's the extreme uh, level. But in Norway, I believe that's the most extreme. They can do everything to stop so it. So they're completely against capitalism. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Okay. So that's they—they they do everything. So I—I I had many experiences like. Uh, the tax authority, yeah. I believe, like they are the craziest thing ever. They came to my home, took my mobile, took my my laptop. Are you joking? No, 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 no. That's for real. In and you know, a tax authority normally the the way that's work, they send you an email asking you about the documents and yeah. about the invoices, and they look through the numbers, right? But not in Norway. When when they want to they look just at come, your number, they, they just, just come, take your phone and. Just download everything. Download even WhatsApp messages. They went through your WhatsApp messages. Even Messenger. Everything. Yeah, everything. And they don't find anything. So I have everything clear, right? Except the photos. <laughs> 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 but 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 like the process when they ask me about that and the process I went through, it like feels very bad because they give you the feeling that you are criminal, even though you're not. So okay, listen, I am ambitious guy trying to build my business. I earned a lot of money in Norway, I understand. And I can see that's from their perspective also. So my name is Adib, I am from Syria. I don't have a, a university degree, mm -hmm. earned millions of dollars and obviously in Norway. And Muslim as well. Like exactly, so what are you doing? You should be doing something criminal if you earn so much money without being in school. So that's totally different for us. So we need to check that. So I had all those feelings and I feel like, okay, listen, if I live in Norway, I'm doing my best to be to become successful and paying taxes, like a lot of money. What, what is the tax in Norway? Whew. So if you calculate everything on the paper, you end up with 65 on everything you earn. Oh, wow. If you really calculate that. So on your personal income, it's 37. On the company and the profit, it's 22. And when you take out also dividend, it's 22 mm. on that. So when you calculate everything, it's around 65. You, do, you don't own the company. They own the company. You work for them. <laughs> it's, it's, it's totally crazy. It's crazy. This is why everyone's moving to Dubai. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So i getting daily messages from people in Norway that's just telling me that I'm working very hard, earning money, but I just feel I'm earning the money to give it to the tax authority yeah, at the yeah. end of the month. So it's very hard. Yeah, I can understand why, like, you would want to leave. I mean, even, like, the UK system is a bit is a bit odd as well. Like, they tax you heavily um, on everything. And, like, a lot of European countries are moving to Dubai, and I don't blame them because you've got safety here. Yeah. You've got stability, and you've got, like, amazing people here. I don't have a negative experience with anybody here. Uh, it, yeah, it's impossible because everyone moving, moving for a, like, very good reason. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they are entrepreneur working, having companies. Yeah. I felt the same. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the same as well. Like, the thing is, one thing about Europe, which is, it's it's always gonna have the cities like London, Milan. You know, you've got Sweden, you've got Norway, those sorts of places, and they've got their own culture. But Dubai is creating a different sort of culture, exactly. right? It's like everyone is hustling, everyone's doing something, <laughs> and you literally meet people, and you're like, wow, like this is crazy. Um, in terms of like yourself, when you came to Dubai, what was your plan when you came here? Because obviously you left Norway. S yeah, so I had, like I didn't plan it so much actually. I just heard so much about Dubai before. Mm -hmm. So that's like, that's the country you need to be, that's the city you, be, you need to be in when you are in entrepreneur. If you're planning to make a lot of money, planning to meet like great people, that's the city. So that's the only thing I heard at the beginning. And I was thinking, okay, do you know what? I, I need to test that. I need to, to, to see the city, test the culture, see how everything works. So when I moved here, yeah, it's just crazy. You, it's crazy. You see, yeah, you see things you've never seen before. The most beautiful people in the world are all here. And I mean, I mean. Everyone is hot. Like how long <laughs> does it take to open a company in Dubai? Like a week? So quick. Yes, yeah, so quick. How long does it take to open a bank account? And when you do transfers, who ask you? It's and just amazing. They just help you, push you to build your business. It doesn't mean that's because 
in Europe they say yeah because they don't have a lot of rules so it's like a kind of hub for criminals yeah it's, like it's money bullshit. laundering it's not money laundering they have systems and everything in place yeah they've just they're just more efficient they're Ex just they're just five ten years ahead of everybody yeah exactly and that helps you a lot because when you do some money transfer in Europe for example you're getting five thousand questions just relax. I'm just yeah, trying yeah. to pay some invoices. <laughs> 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 it's just you're taking that to the next level. We tried to um, take some money out from the UK and we've still not received the money in Dubai. And we've given the paperwork, we've showed everything and they're still like, we're just going to put you over to the fraud department to um, you know, answer some questions and stuff. Has anyone forced you to transfer this money? And it's just like, no, seriously, like, what about all those people that are actually getting scammed? You're wasting time on me? Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> and it's, um, it's crazy. So you, you said you had a few businesses. Did you shut your businesses before you come to Dubai? Like, what businesses were they? They didn't shut it completely, but I just changed my focus uh, to different markets. So at the beginning, I had, I had my university in, in Norway. So I had an online education company. Amazing. Yeah. Wow. So I'm teaching people how to run a consulting business. Okay. Uh, it's a kind of digital, digital marketing. Uh, digital agency, but more so we, we dive deeper inside the problems all the companies we work with have. Mm -hmm. So I had this company in Norway and I actually own a company with my brother. He, what do we call that in English? It's, it's just the kind, you know, all the hotels mm -hmm. when they clean their sheets and their all that. Yeah, the so they send, they send to a cleaner or a mm -hmm. place we have, we have, this okay. company also okay, it's amazing. a very big one it's different from online world because it's big machines oh like a laundry a laundry service exactly okay, okay. but a very big one for okay. the hotels okay. so that's totally different but he just uh, started a company he needed some money to start the company so we started that together in norway shout out to adib's brother <laughs> if you're listening <laughs> <laughs> yeah totally amazing. different mindset so you know in the online business when you make money you make money out of pixels from the screen right yeah, yeah. you provide value through information but in the real world how my brother is doing that it's just crazy machines big it's, stuff yeah it's interesting yes yeah, so different like yeah, the, so yeah. different like a complete different contrast you exactly know? Yeah. okay and then um, you did that. You, you've got the laundry business, the online consulting business. Exactly. And I, when I moved to Dubai, so I focused very, very much on the social media part. Yeah. And my channel went crazy. I just gained 250,000 followers in the past six months on Instagram. Amazing. Which is actually very hard. On Instagram, I feel is the hardest platform. Yeah, it is. Because they, yeah. It's so saturated. Exactly. Yeah. So it. Yeah, it went viral. TikTok around five hundred sixty thousand now, and then YouTube is three hundred fifty thousand. And at the beginning, so to be honest, I'm a very shy person. I never thought I would be in front of the camera, mm -hmm. never. And all all of this started because of a challenge between me and my friend. Okay. So he's Tell a YouTuber. Yes, yeah, so he's a YouTuber, okay. and he's doing like the fashion stuff for guys, helping them how to be a bad boy, dating tips, and all that. And he's telling me. That's the kind of content that gets a lot of views. But if you're going to go out and talk about mindset and business things, you will never get views. And I was so angry. I told him, no, no, no. For sure I will get views. I will show you. So, yeah, I suited up, set in front of the camera, and started some videos. And I went viral more than him. <laughs> Did you? Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so that's everything started as a challenge, to be honest. And from, from there, I just got a lot of feedback, like very, very positive feedback. People are really loving the content and feeling that I'm giving them tips that's actually helped them on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And just continued. But I never see myself as a YouTuber, even though I have 350,000. And it's gr growing with like 50,000 a month. But I never considered myself as a YouTuber. To be honest, <laughs> I've seen some of your stuff. Obviously, it's in Arabic, so I can't understand it. But like some of it, the production, the way that you've done everything, you can say that everything's got so much thought into it and so much planning. And even um, when I've gone upstairs to your apartment, you showed me your studio. Because <laughs> I, <asked laughs> I asked him for some advice, which he's been kindly <laughs> enough to help me. Yeah. Um, and you literally put in so much work. Like you're constantly working. Yeah. You're always hustling and grinding. And like, yeah, yeah, I yeah. always see you in the lobby, like constantly having meetings back to back. Where do you think that drive and hunger comes from? So just remember that like in every minute I am not working, I know my competitors are working. So... I just feel 
when, when, when I went to YouTube, I was thinking, okay, who is the guys that's doing millions of views and why? How can I do the same? But there is also a different mindset for a lot of people when start YouTube. They say 50,000 views is good or 20,000 views is good. Why should you say that? So if you're starting a YouTube channel, let's look at the people who's getting millions of views, what they are doing that's so special. It's that's like their personality, the topics they talk about, or the quality of the production. So I tried, I tried all, the, all that. And at the beginning, I didn't receive a lot of views, to be honest. My first 20 videos, maybe 5,000 views. Okay. Which is kind of good in yeah, YouTube yeah. at the beginning. But I just felt like... It's not good uh, enough. Yeah, yeah, I'm not going anywhere with, this, yeah, yeah. With, with these numbers. And I just thought, okay, listen, I will increase the, pr the, the production quality and I will increase the, like, the quality of the way I talk uh, inside of the channel and change the topics a little bit. How did you increase the production quality? Buy more stuff. <laughs> you bought more stuff. You invested yeah. more into the like the camera, the, the equipment, the lens, yeah, and the and the uh, and the editing team. The editing so, team. So at the beginning, I was editing myself, and oh that wow. sucks. That does suck. I, <laughs> yeah. I really suck at it. I like have that. no idea how to edit a video. I just went to YouTube how to edit a video and try to do that. <laughs> it. Yeah, it went be crazy. It's like I did mine on what's the iMovie. <laughs> <laughs> it was so bad. I had so many spelling mistakes and everything. It's it, because you're tired. Yeah, exactly. And you don't like that's that's a completely new skill to learn. Mm. And that's my, not my skill actually. So I just was thinking, okay, listen, let's hire a full time editor that can help me with editing. And when I did all that, everything started to change. And I believe uh, my break, like the breakthrough, happened on YouTube when. I was really myself in front of the camera. So when I, I, when I tried to, like, yeah, I don't know. Did, like, you, you're a bit stiff. Yeah, yeah exactly. You're, you're not really, like, you're still in your shell. And then I, I think maybe you became more confident. Yeah, so I just, like, that's me. Listen, that's me. That's my story. And if you like me, you like me. If you don't, I don't even fucking care. <laughs> so I just did it that way completely. And I felt like everyone liked the way I present myself. But the first videos, I was too shy, the way I talk, and I was thinking, oh, I should do this in this way. But I feel in YouTube, like the people and the audience really appreciate if you are yourself. Yeah, I think that too, because um, even me, I've got another channel. I've got the Luxury Property channel. The first few videos, I'm not myself. And the last few, I'm like really myself, like yeah. getting in the bath and just making a joke. Because naturally, like I actually love having a laugh like that's just my personality yeah so to kind of like put that away it's like why am i doing it i'm not being myself you know exactly amazing and the youtube journey for you how long have you been doing it around two years now so it started for two years but i really started to work hard on that for the last year so the first year it was just like i did a video and i feel for that so i had no schedule uh, no plan i was just like okay you know what I will give these tips today. And I just starting the camera, doing the video, editing by myself, and it, it one day work. But the last year, I really, really took it seriously because YouTube, like if we compare YouTube to Instagram and TikTok, YouTube is insane. You know, a lot of people don't actually understand the YouTube game. And like when you tell people, I make YouTube videos, they're like, oh, how's your little videos doing? You're doing videos. Oh, like she just does videos online. No. <laughs> and it's like, it's almost like, I can't really sit and explain to you the possibilities of YouTube because no one understands it. Yeah, Not yeah. a lot of people actually understand the YouTube game. They really underestimate it. And, yeah, yeah. and you know this argument I am getting all the time? If you are a millionaire, why you are in YouTube? How you have time to... Like if you're really making money, I have a successful business. Why you are in YouTube? They really don't okay. understand that every single business in the world need an audience. Yeah. Need customers. But it's branding as well. Like yeah. It's your branding yourself. Your people know who you are. Like if you've got a business, they want to know the CEO of the business. They want to know that he's capable of putting himself out there, being vulnerable, giving advice. And you're essentially putting yourself above the rest. I actually went um, to an event and I was listening to Gary Vee, which I absolutely love. Um, and he said that the people that are creating content right now 
um, are the ones that are going to take over the businesses that have been in the market for 20 to 30 years because they're on social media. Exactly. Because that's where the customers is, actually. Exactly. So, like, when I started on YouTube, I was, like, the, inc the revenue increase was insane. And I was, where would the money come from? Ah, okay, that's a YouTube video I did before three months ago. Really? Yeah. Like, it that have so much effect? And, and you actually... Like in YouTube, it's very different from from Instagram and TikTok because short content you can't like you can't explain a lot in a video no, that's in thirty yeah. second. People n never know who you are. No, they. But can't, you yeah. can be controversial. You can say crazy stuff just to gain views and be, be like get viral videos. But on YouTube, you can actually sit down and talk for 20, 30 minutes, where you can explain a lot of stuff and the audience feel a, a good connection to you. So. YouTube was amazing. If if there's one single thing I really, really regret I didn't did before five years ago, that's YouTube. Yeah. YouTube, yeah, it's amazing. That's amazing because I think it's like one of the best things I've done. Like I really enjoy the whole production side of stuff. And before when I first did, okay, I, I'm going to tell you guys something. I watched my first ever YouTube video I ever did the other day. And oh my God, I wanted to jump off the balcony. <laughs> 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 I was like, who the hell is this girl? <laughs> Have you watched your old videos? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I never deleted that because just to show the people an example. So I'm telling them it's not always perfect at the beginning. So look at me. Like, yeah. Because when I watched my first video and I'm like speaking really low and I'm like, <laughs> it was so uncomfortable. I just hated it. I was like, what is happening? And I feel like I've actually become better at speaking and like expressing stuff. So it's quite uh, cringe. Yeah. And, and the, the, the funny part that's every single one that we like follow on YouTube, ha like we have like very, very big channels. If you go down to their first videos, you will see the same. Mm -hmm. If you go to the old videos, they was like shy, don't mm -hmm. know what to talk about. So that's, that's the beginning of the journey. But everyone thinks uh, I need to be perfect at the beginning to start. But that's totally bullshit. No, it's, it's terrible. I mean, I learned a lot. Um, I even was like a presenter for an NFT news company when I was um, working before I just did like full content creation. And they taught me so much about script writing and hooks. And I think like both of us have got a background in sales. Like we both know how to sell and come across like I think a lot of my jobs that I've done previously have helped me mm. get to this position. And you connect the dots after a while, right? You're like, oh, I think I know how to ask questions because I've worked in sales and, and, and I know how to follow things up. Exactly. How do you think um, Dubai has helped you in terms of like growth as a person? So, okay, listen, when, you, when I was in Norway, compared to all my friends, I was rich. When I came to Dubai, I felt how poor I am. <laughs> yeah, same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> same. Yeah, so like when you go out and you see all these crazy people and what kind of businesses they have and what kind of drive they got and all that, you just feel, oh my God, where I have been living. So it helped me a lot to open my eyes that there is so much more than what I thought. And I like from the last day I left Norway, I was really thinking I'm very successful. And for many people, I am. But when I came to Dubai, that's nothing yeah. compared to other guys. And it's not good to compare yourself either. So I'm not saying that. But you see what other people achieved and you understand if they can, you also can. Yeah. You see what's possible. So it helped me a lot in the, on that. So it, it gave me a paradigm shift, like a mindset shift completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when it comes to the business side, the weather, like, yeah, the banks, the company, oh my God, Ooh. it's just amazing. So obviously you said that Dubai has been amazing. How have you seen a difference in Dubai compared to Norway? Yeah, so when it comes to banks, that's that was the main difference. So banks here works completely different than Norway. So when you do a transaction, you you don't get 5,000 questions. Maybe you get one question. Maybe someone calls you just checking. Is that transaction like what it's supposed to be? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, we're done. In Norway, that's totally different story. So when you do a transaction, and especially if that's uh, to other countries, not inside of Norway, they freeze the money. 
they freeze the transaction, first of all, and they send you an email. And this email have like minimum 50 questions. 50? Yeah, 50 questions. And all these questions is insanely hard to answer. So for example, can you tell us uh, more about all your customers? And can you take a screenshot inside of the, like can you, can you take all the invoices every single invoice you sent for the past year. And I'm just doing one transaction now. So why are you asking all these questions? Can you tell us more about uh, this and that? Uh, why you started the company? What? Like, why? I, like, I'm doing a transaction. Why are you asking me why I started the company? Yeah. Uh, what is, uh, um, we know, to, we, we need to know more about your relationship with us in the bank. So we have all these personal questions you need to answer. Can you deliver all these papers? And it's insane. So it takes me at least five days to gather all this information and give that to do one transaction. So that's not the way to do a business in Norway. So that, that's pretty hard. That is hard. And, and is that with everybody or do you think it's specifically with you? No, it's everybody. everybody. So I thought at the beginning it's specifically with me yeah, yeah. until I heard that same story from everybody and everybody is dealing with the same thing. So... But not if you not if you're doing money transfer inside of Norway. That's fine. Norway, Sweden, between Sweden and Norway and these countries. But if you do to Dubai, no, that's tax heaven, right? Yeah. So yeah. you're doing to Dubai. That's for sure money laundering. Now we're gonna freeze it and stuff. Even though if that's like a real invoice for a real thing you did. So have they frozen your money right now? Yeah, they did. What? <laughs> yeah, they did. They, so tax authority in Norway have the most power above all other authorities. So that's, people think police or military, that's not truth. Tax authority have the most powerful, yeah. So, so they can freeze your money, they can take your money out of your bank immediately without even asking, and then you need to deal with it. And maybe it takes one month, two months, three months. They how don't even care. How long have they frozen your, your money for? I believe now I had and issues with them for the past one and a half months. Oh, wow. So that, that's a long period that's of time. That's a long period of and time. I, I believe, like, for sure, everything, if everything is fine because I delivered all the papers they need. But I'm just talking about the process you go through. So, so they doing that with every single entrepreneur who actually doing money transfers outside of the country because they immediately think you're doing money laundering. That's just mm. insane. That's just be super stressful for someone. And do you feel like a lot of people from Norway are moving to Dubai? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. You've I met a lot of Norwegians? I met a lot of Norwegians. Have you? Oh, yeah. wow, I haven't. But I will tell you something. So the difference between me and many different entrepreneurs in Norway is that I am a public guy. Okay. And I talk about taxes. I talk about how good Dubai is, and they hate that. Really? So I get attacked also from the media. How? Where? In Norway. So the, the biggest Norwegian media came to Norway to visit me in my home before two weeks ago. It called v it called Vege. We'll add the link in the description <laughs> for everybody to see. Yeah, yeah, they came to, yeah, they, they're friendly people. So they just asked me, so can you prove everything you talk about on the social media if we come to you? So yeah, sure, come. <laughs> and they literally came here to visit the place and they just start talking about Dubai. Oh, Dubai, it's a place for tax haven. Everyone who actually laundering money comes to Dubai. Why? Like there's oh. money laundering in the in, in, in European countries too. Like yeah. there's just more loop. Like there's different ways to do it. Whereas like everyone wants to hate on Dubai because who likes to pay tax? Just show me these people who actually likes like feel good paying taxes. No one actually doing that. Yeah, they force you to pay the taxes, right? Yeah. So no one likes that. So people in Norway who feel like oh I'm forced to pay all this money out of my hard work and maybe their business, it's like a local business, so they can't move, they will try to find a ways in Norway to not pay the full amount of taxes. That's actually happening every single day. That's why tax authority have 12,000 employees working every single day full time to monitor us, right? But yeah, th that's crazy. And you don't feel the same in Dubai. Dubai don't have tax authority either. Mm, like, I mean, it's like <laughs> really good. They're, and the thing is, they're like, you think that they're not watching you. Dubai, they're, okay, so the thing is with Dubai, you think they're not watching you, but they're watching you. Um, they're just more, li like, they're just more efficient. Yeah. They just know how to do their job. Like, 
even when you go to airports, like I go to the airport in the UK and the system is so slow. Whereas like in Dubai, it's like everything is seamless, quick, fast. They know what they're doing. And even the taxes, like, okay, fair enough. Like they've implemented a little bit of tax recently. Mm. But that's which is fair. Which is fine. Yeah, that's completely fair. I believe it was 9% on, pr- on profit mm-hmm. and 5% VAT. Which is completely fine compared to 65% on every single exactly. dollar you earn. So, yeah. It's not no, bad, no Norway, it? Norway. Yeah, Norway gave me. So I still love Norway as a country. Uh, but running a business in Norway. It's hard. <laughs> yeah, that's hard. That must be hard. You should not. Especially if you've got all, all these like issues from like even allowing you to grow as a business and them having all these questions and then they've got that mindset of not, you know, uh, allowing you to be, be an entrepreneur and, and find it like it's a socialist country. Making money, you're greedy. Driving good cars, like fuck you. You're so greedy. You, you should not. Just earn $3,000, pay the pills, have fun. Just like relax, no money. Uh, this luck, like... Norway hate luxury. Like when, wh- when the Norwegian media came and visit here in like address beach and the building and the way it built and everything. Oh, that's really bad. They didn't like your apartment? Uh, they did, for sure. Ex- like, like the reporter who did, uh, who did the, the, the article about me, she re- I, I felt like, oh my God, I really want to live here. But she's, she just like can't see herself living here because she feel... If she make more money, she's a bad person. That that's the mindset in Norway. Making money is bad. That's like a really weird conditioning. There is like some p- people, even parents, where they condition their kids like that, and then they have issues later on with uh, and their relationship with money. Like making money is bad. All those sorts of things. How is your uh, family now? Are they in Norway? Or yeah, they're, they're in Norway. Okay. But as I told you, if you are an employee in Norway, you are having good life. Yeah. So so. If you are an employee, if you if you actually just like having fun making your three thousand dollar, going to your job, working eight hours a day, train, make family, whatever, that's completely fine. Norway is very good country to have that. Mm-hmm. But if you have ambitious, if you really want to make it big, it's hard. So my family, yeah, having fun, just relaxing, yeah. going to their works. Got a happy son looking after yeah. them. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. nice. It's nice. And um, what have you, like, obviously you've been in Dubai for like six months now. Yeah. How have you found Dubai? Like, and, uh, and I mean that in terms of dating, because uh, you're an entrepreneur, <laughs> you're a successful guy. Yeah. How has that been for you? <laughs> Tell me. So <laughs> there is a lot of hookers here. <laughs> <laughs> Thousands of them. So. Uh, have you ever had a situation where you met a hooker and you didn't know they were her parents so the thing is like i have a girlfriend so i never actually try to date other girls oh okay Okay. so i have a girlfriend but i have friends that's telling me how that works okay so for example i have a friend of mine uh, that's telling me like dubai is the best place for dating that's from his perspective and i ask him okay so tell me more about that and he's telling me like listen alit here in gbr in, in especially in marina so every single girl, or at least 90% of them, they came here to visit Dubai for the first time. And in their country, everyone knows them, so they can't do a lot of stuff. So I'm just like like walking on the beach, looking at the girl, yeah, oh, how are you? What's your name? Oh, my name is Melissa. Oh, nice to meet you. Let's eat ice cream. And he's just taking her home. And he telling literally. An ice cream. Yeah. That's all it takes. <laughs> a gelato. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's he just telling me that it's the easiest city in the world to actually date girls, but not for relationships. See, I've a one night stand, that's easy. Really? Because I've heard the opposite. Me too at the beginning. <laughs> until I met the like some of my friends that's actually have living here for a long time. And they really understand how to do that. They've got, they've got this. Yeah, got but the, the other formula. European guys, like um, my friends, that's actually doesn't doesn't live here for like for for more than six, maybe one year. They just tell me that's so hard. Everyone is a hooker. Everyone like the girls doing that's only for money. I can't find any girl that's not doing that for money. So that's like yeah, totally different perspective on that. Yeah, yeah. I mean. To be honest, there is a lot of like girls that are not hookers here that are obviously looking for relationships, but I just feel like 
from what people have told me, it does a lot. Would you say that it's like hev heavy or not? Yeah, I believe, yeah. Because like w if you are a hooker, where would you go? Uh, yeah, for sure, Dubai. Because you know all the entrepreneurs in Dubai, people making money in Dubai. It, like everything is expensive here. So if you are in five, for example, so I have been in five one time, you know the five palm? Oh yeah. Yeah, that, that's like a crazy hotel uh, with like a beach club. Every single girl is a hooker. And they're doing that like, so they have the price and they, they just talk to you and they, yeah, today it's for 2000. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that's like... I'm getting a bargain. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting a good deal. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's, yeah. And I never experienced that before in Norway and other countries. Yeah, yeah. Even in London, like, you know, I used to work around the Mayfair area a lot because my offices were there. And uh, you just never saw it in the European countries. But here, I've seen it. Once <laughs> I was walking with my father-in-law on JBR, and uh, he's in front of me and I'm walking behind him and some woman comes up and tries to hold his hand. <laughs> and then I got really annoyed. <laughs> and I was like, what are you doing? And then she just went, oh, sorry, sorry, is that your husband? I was like, no, it's my dad. <laughs> 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 oh my God. <laughs> it was so funny. Um, and, and it is here, but um, it's, just, it's just weird. It's just the weird thing um, that we see here. And it's, I think, if you're a guy, you just need to be aware of that, that if someone's like super attractive talking to you um, and you haven't like pulled your game out or done something to get her attention, then you need to just stay alert. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, the, the dating culture is dangerous here. Yeah. 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 How did you meet your girlfriend? She was a student. <laughs> oh, wow. In, yeah, in yeah. Dubai? No, no, no. In Norway. Oh, amazing. So, okay. So we met each other before one and a half years ago. And she, at the beginning, she was a student in my course. Oh, so wow. she studied my material. And we had an interview, like a podcast, exactly so, as we so did you, here. So you were her <laughs> professor. <laughs> yeah, still. <laughs> 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 yeah, so we did the podcast and, uh, or an interview, like a student interview. <laughs> and I actually never thought about anything after the interview but a friend of mine came to my home and looked at the video so he was just looking in on my pc and he just asked me oh what is this video i told him yeah just a student interview can i see yeah for sure and he was looking at that and she and he told he told me oh look this girl is interested in you I said, really how do you see how that how did you know that yeah, yeah and he told me that oh, look he's doing this and this what did she do i don't remember i don't is, remember is maybe she's playing with her oh uh, yeah hair curl. maybe so, but I was really focused on the <laughs> questions to do the, the, the student interview. And he told me, listen, I am pretty sure she is interested. You can send any message you want. And yeah, you will find out very quick. And I told him, okay, she was pretty. So I obviously liked her. So I sent her a message. And yeah, he, had, he was right. He was right. <laughs> he learned about body language. Yeah. I think women are quite obvious when they like a, like a man. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's the hair. And then it's like... I don't know, actually. It depends. It depends on the guy. But yeah, for sure. So, yeah. you know, um, your your whole scenario since you've come to Dubai, how, do you think that you'll be here for a long time? Yeah. So one thing I don't like about Dubai. So now we talked about all the positive. But one, one thing I don't like about Dubai is that things moving very quick. You need a break sometimes. Yeah, it just feels nonstop. So I haven't been busier ever. And it's very hard to not compare yourself to others also because you're seeing like all these supercars, crazy shits going on, which is good. But yeah, it's taking so much energy. It's, there's a famous saying, uh, comparison is the thief of joy. Exactly. If you're constantly comparing yourself to someone else and their life, you're not really, uh, you know, taking the time out to actually enjoy what you have. Because even sometimes me, I'd be like, oh, you know, this person might have this or they've gone here. Or sometimes the other day, actually, I was like, I went on to my, a friend's Instagram and I haven't been on their page in a while. And I was like, God, he's always traveling. I am always working. Like, why am I like, why don't I just like go on holiday? Why don't I just go on holiday back to back? And then I was just like, my mission is bigger. And sometimes when you're just constantly comparing yourself to someone else, you really just don't show gratitude for what you have. Exactly. And you forget everything you actually did in your life and you just feel bad all the time. So, yeah, so that's bad. Uh, but that's a mindset. 
So you need actually to stop that and just look at, actually get, do it for inspiration, not to compare yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I feel like here in Dubai for the last six months, so busy, mm-hmm. things moving very quickly, and I'm never used to 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 that kind of, yeah. So I, I'm not sure if I will still be in Dubai for the next three, four years, but my company and my company structure for 100%, I will have it here. Mm-hmm. But maybe living in Spain for six months, six months in, du- in Dubai. Where in see. Spain? It will be Marbella. Marbella, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I like Marbella. Yeah. It's really nice. There's a lot of people that go there. Yeah. Um, and, in you know, I really like Europe for the summer period. Yeah. Because here it's like, it's not super hot i think it's hot in like august september or Ju- july or august it's like super hot it's not hot. super hot it's it's um it's very hot it's See, 55 but everyone thinks it's like 6 months of the year it's super hot no. i think it's like 2 months of the year yeah. it's like super hot right yeah yeah so you can do more than like 6 months in dubai everyone thinks you you can't stay here when it gets it, hot exactly like you it's, it's very hard to go out in these months yeah, yeah yeah i mean i mean when when it's summer yeah now it's very very hard yeah yeah of course <laughs> do you, no, but do you have like a famous thing that you always say to yourself, like that's been written by? Yeah, someone? so so my my favorite one is actually from Jim Rohn. Uh, be very be very very careful for what you wish for. That was very very nice one because like I feel everyone is wishing actually to get a job or finish the school finish their school and they're getting that. So very very be very careful for what you wish for. It was. Yeah, when I heard that from Jim Rohn and explained what he, what does that mean, it changed a lot for me. Because you can wish to finish the school and get a job, but also you can wish to become a millionaire. You can wish to build a company. So that's for free, right? Yeah. 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 Interesting. Um, that's something that I always ask my guests, like, what is your favorite quote? Because you just said the certain things that people live by. Um, mine is actually, um, I think it's from Jim Rohn as well, actually. Really? When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Yeah. Um, and it's literally, it's like, sometimes you might look at something and it's ugly. Mm. But if you change the way you look at it, it can become beautiful. Exactly. Um, and it could be a scenario, it could be something in life, something that's happened to you. If you always have like a lesson or something bad that's happened... If you see it as like, oh, like maybe this happened for this. So it's just, it's a really good quote and I really love it. It's actually my fiance's favorite <laughs> quote as well. Um, I got it on his birthday uh, wow. cake that I made for him. <laughs> um, so what is it that you want to be known for, Adib? So so my big plan is actually to build the biggest online education company in the Middle East. Because I feel in the in the Arabic world, Yes, it, it's forgotten. So there is a lot of very good entrepreneurs in the English markets teaching people how to become successful, changing people's mindset and all that, but not in the Arabic world. That's never happened before. And when I came to Norway when I was 16 years old, I really, really wished I had someone like me who say these things I say on YouTube because that's really held. So, and I was just made, made my mind I will become this person. So we don't have Jim Rohn mm. in in Middle East. We don't have Tony Robbins in the Middle East. No, we don't. Yeah, so that's why. So and I started the journey and now like I believe I did a lot to change that. So uh, so my my YouTube channel is mainly about mindset and business development and how you can change yourself, become successful. And I believe that's one of the first channels in 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 the Arabic world because Many of the YouTubers, it's all it's only about jokes and like playing games, having fun, laughing, but no one's actually talking about that thing, the things that matter. So yeah, that's that's the big plan for the next five years. Amazing! It seems like you absolutely love what you do, and you've got like a big vision and a mission. Yeah. And um, you know, normally I have guests on, and I don't know what they're like. <laughs> um, but I know what you're like because you're always charismatic and you're always smiling and your energy is so high all the time. Guys, he's actually fasting and he's come onto this podcast <laughs> while he's fasting. Um, and I'm extremely grateful for having you on and I've really enjoyed it. And I, to be honest, I'm going to be following your journey very closely and I'm really excited for what's to come for you, inshallah. Thank you very much. Take also care. Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching this podcast. I really hope you enjoyed it. 
All his details will be in the description below. Do not forget to like and subscribe and I will see you guys very, very soon. Bye.